welcome. How are thank you? you? I'm great. How are you? Great, thank you. Thank you, you folks for coming. folks have had uh, quite a workshop, right, I take it? We did. We had a very educational workshop on evaluating our superintendent. Wow. <laughs> Which he's already left. <laughs> <laughs> he ran out of the room and... Uh, he was effective. <laughs> in, <laughs> um, oh, that's great. Well, it's uh, really nice to be with uh, all of you here this evening. Uh, I'm Julian Sear. I'm the state senator for the Cape and Islands District, uh, which includes uh, both Harwich and Chatham, uh, as well as all the communities from uh, stretching from Mashpee to Provincetown, and then Nantucket, Martha's Vineyard, and the Elizabeth Islands. Uh, and what I've been doing, you know, I think when uh, in, in coming into this position, I just finished uh, my first year uh, in, in this office. I think so many of the things that we do in state government end up coming right back here uh, at the local level to be implemented. And so many of the things that you folks want to do in your town, in your community, in the district, uh, go through Beacon Hill or go through ESE. Uh, and so in my first year, made it a point to visit with all of our select boards of the 20 towns that I represent. Uh, and then this winter, wanted to make a point to visit with all the school committees. Um, and so we've been for Barnstable and DY, glad to be here at Monomoy. Um, we'll, uh, we'll be at Nosset and Mashpee in the island schools soon. Uh, I actually served on the Nosset School Committee uh, when I was a student. I was a student representative, so I'm, uh, I'm um, not a stranger to the really important deliberations of, this, of the school committee, of advocating for the schools, and, and I cut my teeth in politics. The, the first political thing I ever did uh, was advocating for um, a two and a half percent uh, budget override to support the Nauset schools when we had pretty big budget cuts in 2003. Um, so, so, so this is a topic that, that's near and dear to my heart. Um, I, I just wanted to give a, a sort of an overview of the education policy issues that we're grappling with a little bit on Beacon Hill, um, present some other information around, I think, some health data, uh, new data that we have related to the open epidemic, which I think is very important, um, and, then, and then get into conversation with you folks. and. and see what questions I can answer and, and what homework you can give me. Um, so, you know, we have uh, the sort of, sort of the biggest issue that's been talked about on education on Beacon Hill uh, is looking at education funding uh, and, and the funding formula that we have. Uh, there was a foundation, foundation Budget Review Commission that was established several years ago that issued several recommendations around how do we make more how, how, do, how, how does the Commonwealth uh, more effectively and adequately meet the obligation that we have to our schools and our communities, but most importantly to our students? And so out of the Foundation Budget Review Commission, um, a, a series of, of recommendations were made. Uh, and, and there is, uh, I'm glad to sort of walk through those. I think the piece that's important around education policy and education funding is that there seems to be a consensus that it's going to be hard for us to tinker with the existing formula, right? It's going to be hard for us to redistribute the pie. Uh, but what we can do is expand the pie and give a little more for everyone else. And so I think that the thing to be looking towards, I don't expect there's going to be major significant legislation on education this session. Um, there's been some efforts. There was an English language bill we passed in the fall. Uh, there'll be some other. Uh, the Senate passed a healthy youth bill uh, that I was very involved in and supported. Um, but I think the thing to look towards in this conversation about how do we expand the pie uh, is what will be on the ballot initiative, the ballot in 2018, and that's the fair share amendment um, or the millionaire's tax, depending on your leadings. Uh, and this would uh, have millionaires and billionaires pay a higher rate of taxation. Um, this money would then uh, go towards education and to infrastructure, estimated to be anywhere between 1.6 and $2 billion. Uh, actually, it actually may be more money just given the, the latest federal um, federal tax overhaul. And so I think this is going to prompt the conversation uh, on Beacon Hill is sort of, all right, with this additional significant money, how do, how do we go about expanding the pie? And the Foundation Budget Review Commission and the Foundation Budget Review sort of gives us a roadmap around how to look at that. Um, you know, that first and foremost is looking at um, health insurance costs to uh, your schools. You know, you're going to be getting into budget deliberations if you aren't in there already. Um, the cost of health insurance just continues to be uh, very significant 
for schools across the Commonwealth. Um, and, and there's an effort underwear to be like, how do, how do we support that? Actually, in the FY18 budget, which we're in right now, there was a little extra money to support schools with that. Uh, the second piece the Foundation Budget Review Commission talks about is uh, special education and how do you, uh, you know, how do you really help schools, um, you know, meet uh, access uh, and, and, and provide, <coughs> provide a fair level of education. Um, this would be looking at changing, first of all, changing the assumed in-district spend costs, which right now is assumed to be 15%, up to 16%. Um, the other thing that, that I've been really trying to work on uh, and I support is looking at the special education circuit breaker. Um, so, so currently that is at, um, it's reimbursed at 65%. So for Monomoy, uh, that's about 190,000 and some change. Uh, I'm advocating in, in the current budget to raise that to 75% for the special education circuit breaker, which would be uh, 200 uh, $221,269. So, looking at how do we expand uh, support for early education. Uh, back to the Foundation Budget Review Commission, looking at English language learners, uh, the look bill that was passed around giving school districts, frankly, just more flexibility around meeting the needs of English language learners. I think we need to do more. Uh, the Foundation Budget Review also looks at uh, how, do we, how do we measure needy and low-income students. And so when we just use the metric of uh, what students in your population qualify for uh, certain benefits from the state, uh, whether it's uh, family benefits, welfare benefits, et cetera. That number tends to be lower than if you look at uh, utilization from free and reduced lunch. Uh, and that, that's the case actually in, in almost all the schools that I represent. Mm -hmm. The free and reduced lunch number, there's much more utilization of that, and there's less utilization of welfare programs. Uh, so looking at that, uh, and then the Foundation Budget Review also looks at how do we enhance data collection, which I'm sure um, is a headache for your superintendent and, and, and uh, principals and administrators, uh, endless data collection from ESE. Um, and, and then uh, another piece where I'm looking at statutory inflation. So Foundation Budget Review Commission, this is, you know, th this is what I would look towards. I think you'll see a flurry of activity and us taking up this effort in 2019, assuming the fair share amendment passes, <coughs> currently polls at about 75 or 80 percent. Uh, I think a lot of folks seem to like the idea of taxing millionaires and billionaires, um, <laughs> and, and and that could change. Anything's possible in politics, but I think, given the, um, I, th I think that's kind of the environment that we have uh, moving forward uh, and looking towards the coming year. Um, I think certainly I would really appreciate uh, support, you know, and any feedback from the Cape around what priorities, you know, of those areas, what, what are most important? If we're looking to expand that pie a little bit, what do we think is gonna give uh, our region a, a, a fairer shot? Um, I think the other piece then too is that we can take this, Sarah Peak, myself, others in the Cape delegation, looking to see where commonalities are elsewhere in the Commonwealth, uh, so we can, we can work a little collaboratively on that. Um, so I'm hoping to have a, a meeting or two, maybe three, before we get to 2019, so we can be really prepared. Uh, so certainly would welcome your feedback and participation on that. Um, getting back to healthcare, which has been a real priority, I know, for, for school districts from a cost perspective and, and budget uh, perspective. Uh, the Senate took up a comprehensive uh, healthcare reform effort in November. Uh, it's a pretty uh, broad effort if you look at our healthcare spending, um, we too have a budget problem uh, largely driven by our healthcare spending. 43% of the Commonwealth's budget uh, is to our mass health program. If you include other health and human services activities, uh, it's nearly 50% of our $41 billion budget uh, is going to healthcare. Um, this is not sustainable. Uh, and nor is the cost of healthcare for families here in Harwich, in Chatham, uh, across the district I represent, and across Massachusetts, and the cost of employers uh, keeps increasing and increasing. Uh, so there's a whole host of provisions that was done in this omnibus bill. Uh, several provisions I think that are most beneficial to us here on the, on the lower Cape is the expansion of telemedicine services, and also the expansion of uh, what EMTs and paramedics can, what services they can provide and what they can be reimbursed for. That's gonna be really helpful in towns like Harwich and Chatham. Um, and then a whole host of other efforts at uh, 
looking at the variation of price across the system. Um, it's quite wonky and I'm glad to get into it if you like, uh, but I think know that this is something that uh, we hear and I really hear uh, that healthcare costs are drowning our school districts, our families, uh, are burdening our businesses, uh, and this is something that we're working on, and, and, and I'll, I'll be continuing to work on this. This is a space that, that I've been working on from a policy perspective in, in the Senate. Um, the other piece that I want to mention, uh, and I believe that, that the bottom line system is on, you folks get your health insurance through uh, the Cape Cod program, um, but for retirees in the system, um, or in your former districts, um, may receive health insurance with the GIC. Uh, the, gen, uh, the, the, the Group Insurance Commission released, uh, released a proposal that essentially shrinks uh, from having f six carriers to three. It's quite controversial. Uh, folk, a lot of folks are not happy about it. Sarah Peake and I are holding, insisted that the GIC come to Cape Cod. They weren't gonna come to Cape Cod, uh, but insisted they come here and they're holding a hearing tomorrow in Hyannis. Uh, it's gonna be from 2.30. Uh, on at the Highness Youth Center. Um, definitely want to encourage uh, particularly retirees uh, to chime in on that. Um, and then I just wanted to mention uh, you know, two other pieces related to education. I think time and again, I hear and I think most of us who are living in our communities hear or are living uh, the challenge of how profoundly unaffordable our communities uh, have become, how costly our communities are to live in, largely driven by housing. Uh, and for young families, uh, the lack of childcare uh, <coughs> options, um, the fact that we don't have universal pre-K systems is something that's a challenge. Uh, my predecessor actually work, worked on this issue. This is something that I think I'd like to see us um, renew. I'm, I'm sure you folks have actually been working on this as well. Um, but however I can support um, universal pre-K in our communities, I think this is something we can do. Uh, there's different models here, uh, whether it's a voucher program, whether it's establishing programs within the school district, school <laughs> systems. Um, certainly we have uh, providers that are in our districts uh, or within our communities already. But I think when we look at um, families who are trying to make ends meet in Chatham and in Harwich, uh, childcare is something, especially for folks who you know, are working full time, uh, childcare is something I think we can help with. And early education is something I think we help with. Um, and then I just wanted to, to, to highlight uh, some information as it relates to the opioid epidemic, which I think is quite relevant to our schools. Um, so we're in about, I, I should say my background is as a public health person. I worked at the Department of Public Health for six years prior to this position. Uh, so, so I like to really kind of sink my teeth into epidemiology and, and health data. Uh, we're in about year 14, 15 of the opioid epidemic here on Cape Cod. Uh, a little longer when you look in New England and nationwide. Uh, so Barstow County, the health department, did this really um, smart look back at death data, looking from 2004 to 2014, a snapshot of saying, all right, what can we learn about uh, the several hundred, hundred individuals who died of opiate overdose? What commonalities can we find about them, <laughs> right? That, that can guide our interventions and our prevention work. How do we, how do we fully, how do we more uh, regress, uh, aggressively respond. If you look at opiate overdose, the rates of opiate overdose are actually decreasing statewide. That's not happening here on the Cape. Uh, on the Cape, it's plateaued at best, if not, is continuing an increase. And so what this information found, if you looked at, so from 2004 to 2014, there were 281 individuals who died of, um, of, of an overdose of poisoning by opioids, either heroin or, or pills. So 281, and what's really interesting if you look at that population is of those 281 individuals, 69% of them have a high school education or less. So meaning these are what we would call straight to work. Um, if if they're, they are students in our school systems or people who are growing up here uh, who are, uh, or folks who are moving here um, <coughs> who have a high school education or less. So they're, they're not the students in our system who are going on to college, either at the community college or off Cape. Um, they are folks who are going straight to work from high school. And then of that, again, that 281 number, um, over 65% of them 
are employed in services and trades, which I think is something that wouldn't be surprising for us given the, what our economy is here. But one in four, 25% of them, are employed in, in construction. And so from a risk perspective, I think this county data is really, I think in, in part tells us something we know, but I think really highlights that when you look at who's most at risk for um, opiate use and then ergo opiate overdose leading to death, uh, if we look at what's happened, what's happened here in Barstow County for a decade, it's, it's uh, students, it's, it's young people in our community who uh, only have a high school education or aren't even graduating out of our high schools, um, though, though I am aware of the pretty robust programs that we've got across the Cape to get folks to graduate. Um, so they're folks with a high school education and they're in services but primarily in construction. And I think that information um, from an intervention and prevention perspective, I think, I hope is helpful. Um, certainly the county has a much more thorough presentation uh, on this data and I encourage either the school committee or, or relevant folks in the district to reach out to them. I think it's important um, given that if you look at how this epidemic's behaving, uh, it continues to uh, impact our communities and impact our young people. Uh, and so I wanted to just share that information. And I've been sharing it with all the school committees because I think it's uh, compelling. Um, if there's anything that I can do or my office can do, uh, certainly, certainly on this issue, we're gonna be taking up a, um, the governor has filed proposed legislation uh, and the legislature will be acting on this legislation. Essentially it's a opioid 2.0 bill in the coming months. If there are specific programs, initiatives, policies that you think would make, um, would help prevention and, and intervention work here in the Montemoy district, whether high school level, the middle school level, the elementary level, um, please be in touch with me, let me know. Um, I'm actively soliciting ideas and thoughts around how we, what we can do on this. Uh, and then of course, more, broad, more broadly, uh, you know, would love to hear, you know, take any questions from the committee, uh, hear what issues, you know, on your, are on your mind, uh, and how, you know, we can just, well, I can support uh, what's a, just a tremendous school district uh, and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful community uh, that's been built between uh, these two towns. Thank you. So thank you. Any questions for Ms. Stubbs? I have a um, question comment, and that is um, with the change in our starting schedule mm -hmm. for elementary school starting earlier, we have our children getting out of school that are at elementary level at 2.30 instead of 3.30, and no older siblings are there to help take care of them. And you mentioned the thing about childcare. Um, it used to be kind of onerous for schools to be saying anything about, because we're the educators, not the child care people, but we have the kids here at 2.30, and so I don't know if other schools are thinking about this, but it's, it's expensive, it's very expensive for the parents to take up that time from 2.30 to 5.30, say. Um, so I don't know if there's any grants or funding that could be provided kids are here, maybe the, some program should be here. It can be defrayed without the parents having to put a large bill for it. It's just a thought. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's a, a, a great um, you know, observation. That there's been a real push, and I've seen this, you know, when I was in high school at Nauset, you know, I think we were done by like 1.40 in the afternoon, um, and, and, and now I, when, when I come to the, the schools as I often do, um, and the high schools, it's like, wow, they're still going. It's, you know, 3 o'clock, 3.30. Um, and, and there's been, uh, you know, that's a policy. I think it's going to be driven around trying to be responsive to um, behaviors and biology and a whole host of things. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with, but I will ask, um, first, whether or not the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, has any guidance or assistance um, on that for schools. My hunch is they don't. Um, I, I work pretty closely with ESC when I was in, um, when I worked at the Department of Public Health, so I can appreciate uh, many of the dynamics there. I think that um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not familiar with sort of direct sort of grant programs or anything. Um, you know, what we, we, to be, in being very honest, it's such a fight for us just to sort of get, give you folks what you get um, from the state, but I, I, I think that really merits um, 
you know, further, further discussion, conversation, how do you do that? And, and, and with the changing times and length of the school day, um, certainly there's uh, workforce considerations in that, a whole list of costs as well. Um, but I think, you know, you do have, you know, these remarkable community resources, which are these school buildings, um, you know, which, which are here and, and, and which hopefully, and, and many of them are being used by the community. So how do you, right. how do you throw that needle and how you do it? Right. Um, I don't know, but, but I can keep right. thinking about it and looking into it. Because it's not really a school issue. It's not a school funding issue so much. It's really a community needs issue. Um, but we happen to have the children. Yes, and, and, and you know, in, in being honest about where we provide <coughs> support for children and families, we actually provide very little support broadly. Um, and, and the only place that we really do that is our schools. And so we just, you know, from a legislative perspective, from a policy perspective, from a societal perspective, you know, we just keep asking schools to do more and more and more and more. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if that's uh, fair per se, but I also think this is this is the, uh, the location where you have a captive audience, and so how do you, how do you at least make sure that you're following up that with something really meaningful? You know, I don't know, but it's we agree on the problem. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I, <laughs> Thank I, uh, you. Yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Mr. Russell. Thanks for coming, Julia. <clears throat> we should make this kind of a yearly thing. Just the, you're so informed and. We're down here on the peninsula, so it's good to hear from our uh, uh, senator. Glad and, to. And thank you for not asking us who we voted for, so that would be good. Sort of <laughs> I don't think that's legal, no, I don't. <laughs> and I, I no one would ever ask that. Um, a question. Yeah. You mentioned this millionaire's potential yep. tax, and if it passed in 19, you then went on to say there are five or six areas you were interested in to see maybe that extra sum could be channeled, which I think would be great. Uh, my, uh, exclusive of Chapter 70, <coughs> would you, if this does come to pass, w would you, uh, S uh, DSS, be contacting the superintendents throughout the 351 community to say what do they think about uh, funding this this amount of funds? Because w we're short of money, not only in just the four circuit breakers, et cetera, but clearly we could find ways in which and probably the best bet would be to uh, contact the superintendents in the yeah. regions and ask them if it came to pass, where do you think this chunk of money should be targeted to lift up some of these kids to another level of rigor? So the the the, 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 the uh, six or seven things that I went through are actually part of recommendations that were um, convened from this Foundation Budget Review Commission, which included uh, a whole host of education stakeholders, including um, superintendents, teachers, uh, unions, uh, state agencies, um, but you know, so what I can do is I can make sure that you have a copy of the Foundation Budget Review Commission and if you folks have specific ideas, let us know. Um, the, the, there's a proposal to take these recommendations, which, which were done sort of by, you know, you, can, you bring together a, a commission, a panel to come up with best practice recommendations. Um, whether or not, whether or not the legislature adheres to those recommendations is often kind of the, um, the, the unknown piece. Uh, there is a push among some folks, and I'm supportive of this actually, is to pass, to basically pass a law that would say, all right, if we, if this money comes to pass, we're <coughs> committing ourselves to spend this money to education and to spend this money towards this Foundation Budget Review Commission. That isn't guaranteed, and, and the legislature and, and the administration has a, um, I don't want to call it a bad habit, but a, a uh, a history of um, reappropriating dollars that may be sort of assigned for one, it may be passed and enacted for, for one thing and, and, and we use it for something else. I mean, now sometimes that, that's necessary because you have a recession and a whole host of things. Um, so so, so I, I'd like to, you know, from my perspective, I think if we're going, if there's going to be a ballot initiative asking taxpayers to, you know, or asking citizens to change how we go about taxation, and it's going to bring in new revenue, um, you know, I think it's a good thing to be transparent and say, all right, hey, if you pass this, here's what we're going to use the money for. So you've got a sense of what we're going to use the money for. Um, I think that in the Senate, there's more support for this. I'm unsure about that support in the House. Um, but certainly welcome any ideas and thoughts that you would have uh, on that. And I think also 
part of the piece why I'd like to convene, you know, a working group among the various school committees uh, and the various districts in the next year, maybe one or two meetings, maybe three, just to take a look at the foundation budget review and say, all right, you know, of these six or seven recommendations, which, you know, which would make the most difference for your districts and also what's left out. So what's left out of foundation budget review, there's no talk of regional school district, uh, regional uh, transportation funding for school districts, which is a huge issue that we were always sort of fighting on. Um, so, so that's my intention in raising it. Uh, those aren't priorities that, um, I'm, I, the priorities tend to make sense from, from, from my perspective, but they're uh, priorities that were recommended by, by a group. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Russell. Any other questions or comments or anything? Ms. Stout. I, I think this might be the first time any representative has come and asked her thoughts on anything. I, I so, think so. Thank you. No, Sarah's visited us. Sarah, Sarah's she definitely comes, visited Yes, yeah. she's she visits. Talk to us. And that's wonderful, too. Yeah. But I really appreciate you asking for feedback, not just hearing. <coughs> thank you. No, and, and, you know, really appreciate um, you know, certainly getting to work with Representative Peek, who yes. uh, is just a wealth of knowledge and, and also who's really risen in the ranks in the House, mm -hmm. um, which is a much more uh, parochial, bigger place. Uh, and so her, her success is our success, uh, and it's great to partner with her. Mm -hmm. And actually the whole Cape delegation, you know, I think in this, uh, we're in a pretty toxic political moment nationally, um, and that's not what my job is like every day serving with the fellow folks who work who represent Cape Cod, the islands. Um, you know, we're, 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 a, we're a bipartisan delegation, we have Democrats and Republicans. Um, but nine out of ten of the issues that we face are not partisan ones. And we work really collaboratively in that, just personally, but also I think for, for the region, um, that's something that gives me a lot of encouragement and hope uh, when, when uh, I don't feel that way if I, if I, when I tune into the national news. So, thank you. Thank you so much right. for the opportunity. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it.